JavaScript in its first incarnation was honestly really terrible to use for a lot of people um, and still basically has this mantra of being a bad language to this day, a lot of it being because it didn't have a way to use macros. Hello everybody, I hope all of you are doing great. I just wanted to make a really quick video talking about the very elusive macro in Lisp. Today I'll be talking about the macro in Emacs Lisp and Common Lisp. Now chances are that if you guys have ever heard of the term macro, you've probably heard of it in the context of languages like C, um, but they've become more common in languages, especially more recently with languages like Rust and Zig becoming new popular languages that heavily use either macros or something that act very similar to macros and are, as far as Lisp is concerned, macros. Now, if you're coming from the perspective of a C programmer, chances are that you know of macros as a ugly hack that you use as little as you possibly can because they are so terrible to deal with. Now in Lisp, this is actually not the case. Lisp is well integrated into the language versus with C, it's an entire separate language. But in Lisp, you actually get macros built into the language and they're thoroughly thoroughly supported, and honestly one of the biggest reasons that Lisp was such a great success and still has languages uh, taking inspiration from it to this very day. In fact, Rust's macro system is very heavily inspired by a scheme. Now rather than making you guys sit around waiting for me to give you a real example, I'm going to go ahead and dive in and give you a quick overview and a simple macro example just to kind of get your feet wet. Then we'll dig into why macros matter, why we even want them, and why languages keep trying to imitate Lisp macros, even though in reality none have really come quite as close. And this is really, like I said before, the big thing that has kept Lisp uh, being so prominent in the world. All right, so just starting out, I've got a REPL over here and a little text window that I'll be working in, and we'll jump back and forth between the two as we go. So first off, I kind of wanted to really quickly just glimpse over the general syntax of Lisp, just uh, in case for some reason you're watching this and you don't know it. Um, really put really simply, everything in Lisp is a list. And so a list is specified with a set of parentheses and the function name goes at the start. So add, so plus one and two, and then just evaluating that we can see down here that that is three. Um, and just putting that over here, we can see, there we go. One plus two is three. Um, and then we can do the same with minus one minus two is negative one, et cetera, et cetera. So that's generally the main syntax. And then to create a list, we could do list, and that will make a list, or we could quote it, which will prevent evaluation. And then now we can do like an A, B, we can make do that, but we cannot do a list. So this will throw an exception. So as you can see um, right here, the main thing that happens is, with quote is it prevents evaluation and a list will evaluate everything. And so we'll be talking more about this as we go. So as we said before, we can create a list by using a quote, and then what we don't want to evaluate. Now what we don't want to evaluate can be an entire expression like we just did, so plus one, two. If we evaluate that, then we will get one and two as a list. Now the big thing with macros is that they allow you to kind of treat these like tokens as you would in a compiler. If you guys have ever learned about compilers, um, it can be really helpful. Now just for you guys that have been uh, trying to catch up, here are some really quick examples of some things you can do. So you can use cutter to grab the rest, car to grab the first. You can use first if you use common lisp to grab the first element. So the most simple example of how you could use a macro is you could write it kind of as if you were going to write a function. So for example, if we wrote a function, we would do defun uh, add, and then this takes a and b, and then this will add a and b. We could do add one, two, and we get three. Now we could also make a macro, for example. So we could do def macro, and then we could call this one add, add m for add macro, a, b, and then this would just be plus a b. So now if we compile that and do add m, we'll see that we get the same result. So you're probably wondering, okay, what's the what's the point here? Like, why does this matter? Well, the difference here is that uh, a macro is kind of evaluated at compile time. And so what you kind of want to do is you want to have a macro return code. So obviously this is not very well suited for the use of a macro because basically all we're doing is just inserting this code rather than running a function. So it doesn't really make much sense to use a macro here, but what would be a better example use case? 
Now our better use case would be when we want to simplify our code, um, for example if it's getting two parentheses filled and it's starting to look a bit extreme and we're reusing an idiom like that all the time. So just to kind of give you guys a better uh, intuition of what's going on, let's just go ahead and uh, expand this. So I have added this quote here, um, just for notation, but let's go back to the original. So let's do add m12. Uh, we can run it in the terminal like I did, I mean the shell like I did before, and we get a three. Now if I put a quote here, and I do something called macro expanding, so without the quote and I do control C, enter, uh, you'll see that the macro expands to three. Okay, we'll expand on this in just a sec. If we put a quote here and do control C, enter, and we do that again, we will see that we get plus A and B. Okay, what does that exactly mean? Well, you'll see that we can, you can see right here that we've got a lot of warnings. So if we go ahead and actually run this, we get an exception. Variable A is unbound. What is going on? This should be like the same thing, but it should be returning a list. Why am I getting an exception? Like for example, if I go ahead and put a quote there and run add, just the normal add, we just get this as a list. But for some reason, the macro is giving us an exception. And that's basically because of the way that macros work. Macros, like I said before, expand at compile time and therefore actually inserting code, just like you would if you used a C macro, where it allows you to basically expand on code and insert new code. So now what would you do if we wanted to make this work? Well, first, let's change this quote to a quasi quote, uh, since that allows us to unquote. And now we'll unquote A and B. So now if we compile that and we expand this, we'll see now that the macro expands to add one and two. And if we actually run this in the REPL, it will add one and two. Because basically what's happening is this list that is returned um, will sub in the values one and two, and it actually returns the code that will then be ran. And so this avoids a lot of the use cases where you'd see people doing, you'd construct a list of uh, one, two, and then you'd have to run eval. Now you can do this, um, and it does work. You'll see that we get three down here. Eval is something that you probably don't want to be using, um, mostly because it does complicate code quite a lot. It means that you need to include eval. It means that you can't compile it, so it's going to be a lot slower. Um, there's a lot of negatives to using eval, so you want to avoid using eval, and this is kind of where this comes up. And besides just avoiding eval, uh, this can also be very useful for doing compile time stuff. So say, for example, if we did concatenate string, hello world Gavin. So we've got this and we can evaluate that. You see that we get hello world Gavin. Now this can be really helpful and let's just go ahead and put this into a defun uh, example. And so we can compile our function. There we go, we get the result that we were hoping for. Now the issue is say for example, if we're running the function example a hundred times, then we're gonna be assuming that your compiler doesn't optimize this. It's gonna have to run this every single time. Now alternatively, if you know that these will be known at compile time, you can actually do def macro concat comp for concat at compile time. And so what we'll have the arguments be is rest uh, strings. And what we'll do is we will do reduce. And so if we did this, and just for the strings, we gave it hello world. And so now it will concatenate all of that. Um, and so rest will actually give us a list. Uh, and so now if I compile that, copy all that, and run it, we get our strings. And if we did expand that, then we would actually get our strings. So this is what's actually being inserted at compile time. And so this is a pretty simple example, but you can do some really complex computation at compile time, which can be very, very helpful for making small optimizations that your compiler can't infer. Now, for those of you guys who have seen a lot of the more modern languages, because um, obviously Lisp is modern, I guess, but uh, it's a bit old and hasn't really been updated um, in decades. Uh, but the big thing with Lisp is that it allows you to do these things. And in more modern languages like Rust and Zig, they've also been trying to do this. It's actually a really big selling point for languages like Zig or Nim. Nim has taken a lot of advantage in this. Um, a lot of languages have embraced this. Even C++ has tried to mimic some of this with its const uh, eval and const expr features. Um, so that's a really good example of just how powerful this feature can be, is that all these languages are trying to mimic that same uh, feature. And finally, for another really simple idiom that people often use macros for is for the simplification that I talked about before. Probably the best example is the with idiom, and you'll see that you can see it used all over the place. Um, and so what we'll do here is we'll kind of simulate, uh, for those of you guys that have programmed in C, where you would either return zero or negative one, 
what we'll do here is we will either run the code that we're given um, and return it, or we will, if we get an exception, return negative one. Um, is this useful? Probably not particularly, but this is just a really simple example of how you can use this to simplify code. And so what we'll do is we'll take a body, um, and what we need to do is we'll do a handler case, and then we'll just put body here for now. And then we will handle any errors that we're given. So if we get any errors, we will return negative one. And then what we will do is we need to return this as code, because obviously we won't know the body. Um, well, I guess we will know the body at compile time, but we don't want to actually know if we'll get an exception at compile time. So we need to actually insert this code. So how we'll do that is we'll just do an unquote. Um, there we go, we didn't get any errors. It's looking good so far. Um, and we'll do with dash run or neg, uh, and we'll give it some code to run. Um, so probably the best example to use is just error. So this will throw an error, we'll just say bad. And then when we run that, and so now as you can see, since we gave an error, we get that. Um, and we could do anything here, we could run any code. So we could do hello, we run that, you'll see that we get an exception, which is not what we were expecting. And the big reason is that we need to actually wrap this in a progen. Um, and this will just make sure that we actually stay in the current space, because basically what's happening, actually, let's remove this prog in just for example's sake, compile that. And so if we expand this, you'll see, um, so when we do that, what we're actually inserting is this. So as you can see, we are basically, um, we're expanding to the wrong thing, because now our handler case is going to see this and think bad is part of our handler case. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we use a prog in uh, to actually capture all of this and keep it in the um, current expression location. I'm not really too sure what the proper term is. And hopefully this all makes sense. So now if we do that and compile it and run it, we now get what we were expecting. And if we run like this, we will see that we print the hello world and we throw our error. And if we don't throw our error and give it a zero, then we will return a zero instead of the negative one. And so as you can see, this can really simplify code versus inserting all of this. If we wanted to do all of this as a function, uh, I don't actually know if this would even be possible. Probably the best way to do it would be to do something like uh, put it all like as a list. And then what we would have to do is we'd have to quote it to avoid this from being expanded because we can't have it expand until it's inside of the handler case or basically our try catch block and then it would work but uh yeah as it is right now you can't really do it with the function without adding a lot of um complexity right in your face and then you have to expose the user to the thought of like oh should i be quoting this should i be unquoting this etc cetera, etc cetera. and so now we get on to the why why do macros matter why do we care well, macros are probably the biggest reason that a lot of languages have been held back as time has gone on. For example, a really good one would be JavaScript. JavaScript in its first incarnation was honestly really terrible to use for a lot of people um, and still basically has this mantra of being a bad language to this day, a lot of it being because it didn't have a way to use macros. Now, people wouldn't say that. They would say that it lacked certain features or it had certain um, issues with it. But a lot of those issues could have been resolved by macros, and I'm going to tell you about exactly how that could have been done right now. So first, probably one of the biggest examples of really ugly JavaScript that you used to see is this sort of notation where you had to use var as your keyword to define variables. The issue with var was that it didn't have scoping. It only had function or global scope. And so as a result, you basically had to do this ugly wrapping, which I'll have on the side over here, um, that basically was done just to get around this. It was basically the only way to um, create little scopes that you could run certain like parts of your code in without having to worry about your scope getting leaked out into global scope. And finally, a language feature that still hasn't even made it into JavaScript. There are proposals for it, but as far as I know, it hasn't made it in is actually pattern matching. Common Lisp, a language that predates it by decades, has pattern matching. And the reason that it has pattern matching is as a library. Someone implemented pattern matching as a library, and it feels just as native as everything else. Um, and that's using macros. That's using a lot of Common Lisp features to do quite a lot. Now, really quickly, I wanted to give a couple examples of really powerful things people have done with macros. 
For example, Clojure used macros to implement something very similar to Go routines, which is really awesome. Uh, and it allows you to do quite a lot. It's really cool. Uh, there's actually a video, I'll try and link it down below if I can find it, that actually goes over the internals of it and how it's actually all done as a macro. And another example of something that's really cool that has been done with macros is the awesome project called With C Syntax, which is a common Lisp library that implements C syntax for common Lisp um, as part of the language. It's really cool. Um, I'll have some links for that linked down in the description. Uh, really interesting. And as a result, you were able to get a whole new syntax. Now, obviously that's using more advanced features than what I've shown in this video. Hopefully I'll get a chance to actually dig into reader macros um, a bit more in the future, but obviously for this video, that's a bit out of scope. Anyways, guys, that's it for this video. Once again, I'll try and dig a bit deeper into this in future videos. Uh, for those of you guys that were worried, don't worry. I'm not done using Common Lisp. I'll be talking about Common Lisp more and more in the future. Continuing on, I just wanted to say thank you to my supporters on Patreon. Thank you to Dangarimp, Will Taylor, Andre uh, Tarinkin. Oh my God, I'm so bad with names. Uh, Alexander, Alexander Artemenko. Jim Lawson, uh, Miguel, and Russell Willis. Once again, thanks you guys for supporting the channel. If you want to support the channel, I really appreciate it. It helps me focus more on making videos. If I can keep focusing on my videos, I can actually get more released and I don't have to get sidetracked trying to make up for time and money uh, on the side. And once again, thank you to my GitHub sponsors, Brian Jenks. I really appreciate your support. Anyways, guys, that's it for this video. Thanks for coming by, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.